Good morning again. I'm going to do a little introduction and then we'll pray and get started. Um, about 10 years ago, I read a book by Watchman Nee. Um, and shortly after that book, I did a sermon um, basically based on that topic and used a whole bunch of uh, illustrations that he had in there. Um, today's sermon is going to be a, a modified, updated version of that sermon. Carol kept telling me, why don't you just use it again? And I've spent two weeks changing it. <laughs> um, so here we are. Um, Watchman Nee was a second generation Christian born in China in 1903. Um, he became a Christian himself in 1920 at the age of 17. Um, he's remembered for his leadership of a native church movement in China um, and also for the hundreds of little books that he wrote uh, to help believers be all that they could be um, that God desired for them. He was imprisoned for his faith during the Cultural Revolution um, in 1952, and he stayed in prison for the next 20 years until he died at the age of 69. One of the books he wrote is about Paul's letter to the Ephesians called Sit, Walk, Stand. Uh, maybe some of you read it, have read it. I know that Lloyd has because he recognized the name, the title this morning. Um, little did I know how much of me I would see in that book when I read it. So many of his ideas um, that we're going to talk about today uh, came from, his, from Watchman Nee's book. Growing up, I was blessed with a mom and dad that loved each other very much, and I know not everybody has had that blessing that I've had. I also had two great brothers that um, I fought with all the time, as normal brothers do. Um, but uh, these brothers are my best friends now and would do anything for me. Um, we were a family that did everything together. Um, including going to church together. We went to a denominational church all the time, but we never read the Bible, and we knew nothing about our personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Um, but you see, in, in my family growing up, we were not good at sitting, walking, or standing. We were doers. We had the idea that sitting was for lazy people. Um, walking was not as efficient as moving quickly. Standing was wasting time, and I got to tell you, we always, when we were driving in the car, we always pointed out the guy on the side of the road who had a shovel in his hand or a broom in his hand and four people standing there watching the one guy work. And I still do that. Um, we are fortunate to still have my 96-year-old mom living only a few miles away from us. Um, Carol and I get to see her most days, and when I go over to visit, uh, the first thing she asks is, what did you do today? If I, if I were to, this is before I retired, um, if, if I were to call my mom or brothers on a Saturday, they would ask, what are you going to do today? If I called on a Saturday night, the question would be, what did you get done today? I would have the same questions for them. If our answer would be, I spent the afternoon reading a good book, or I was watching a game on TV, they would come back with the next question, are you sick? Do you have the flu? Is everything okay? You see, in my thinking, studying is okay, but reading for pleasure is wasting time. Playing any sport, fixing something, building something, designing something, all that kind of stuff is okay but sitting around watching TV during daylight hours or doing something else like that, it's just not okay. I have a tendency to look at anything that I consider non-productive as wasting time. And I'm embarrassed to say I've been retired over eight years now and not much has changed. You need to know I'm not boasting here, this is a confession. Obviously, there is nothing wrong with spending an afternoon sitting around reading or watching a game or doing whatever else you like to do that is, quote, non-productive. My family just didn't do that. We all enjoyed doing. A psychologist would probably say that without realizing it, our self-worth 
was likely centered on her accomplishments. The point I want to make here is that also without realizing it, our position in Christ was likely subconsciously intertwined with our doing. That's what I want to talk to you about today. Although this will not be a detailed study on the letter to the Ephesians, we will be looking at Paul's letter to study our position in Christ. If you're able, would you please stand with me today as we pray? Lord Jesus, I do thank you for the day. Um, I thank you that you have brought us together, that you are with us, that you are our God. If you had not called us here, if you had not chosen us, we would not be here at all today. Lord, I pray that everything that is said and done brings glory to your holy name. Lord Jesus, help us to make much of you today. I thank you and praise you in your name. Amen. Um, well, if you still want to stand, I'm going to read the first nine verses of Ephesians chapter 2. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in, what you want, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up, with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages we might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not of works, so that no one may boast. You may be seated. Unlike some of Paul's other letters, like to the Corinthians, where he was addressing problems when they met together, or the Thessalonians, where he was answering questions, the book of Ephesians gives us a good balance of Christian teaching. Ephesians was likely written in AD 62 while Paul was under house arrest in Rome. That puts the writing approximately 30 years after the cross. That's not very long. Ephesians has two main themes, that Christ has reconciled all of his creation to himself and that Christ has united people from all nations to himself. This is done through the, the powerful, sovereign, and free working of the, our triune God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We will only recognize these truths if we receive them by faith through his grace. In light of these great truths, we Christians are to lead lives of gratitude to our Lord and Savior. Ephesians is normally split up into two sections, but for our purposes today, I'm going to divide it into three sections. Our position in Christ, which covers chapters 1, 2, and 3. How we live our life in the world, chapters 4, 5, and most of 6 and then our attitude with the enemy, which is the end of chapter 6, which you're all familiar with. The letter to the Ephesians starts out very spiritual, talking about our union with Christ in heavenly places. Then about halfway through, starting in chapter 4, Paul switches to very practical terms about how we live this spiritually heavenly life here on earth. In Watchman Nee's book I mentioned earlier, he picked out three key words to express the central ideas of these three sections. Sit, meaning that spiritually we are seated with Christ in heavenly places. Walk, meaning that we are challenged to conduct our lives worthy of the high calling of our position in Christ. And stand, that expresses our attitude towards an enemy that has already been defeated. So let's start with the idea of sitting, because that is where our Christian life starts. However, I did not know it for many years, and I have to believe that most new Christians don't either, because we don't tell them. I think most people think that now that I'm a Christian, I must be doing something to help God. 
In Matthew 6, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus speaking about things like prayer and fasting. He delivers the Lord's Prayer. And then he finishes with, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. He doesn't say to build the kingdom. He says, seek the kingdom. Why did he use the word seek rather than build? I think it's man's nature to desire rewards for, good, for doing good works. It's a very short walk from being the prodigal son who returns to his father humbled and broken and knowing that he can't do it on his own to being the, the self-righteous older brother who thinks that his father owes him for being that, quote, good man. So what does Paul mean by sitting? Referring to Christ, Paul says in Ephesians chapter 1, starting in verse 17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. Then Paul goes on in chapter 2, verse 6, and he tells us where, where Christ's followers are. God raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So God created, seated Christ at the right hand in heaven, then he seated us next to Christ. This happened when we, were first when we first trusted Christ, before we could do anything to impress God as to how worthy we are or how much we have to offer him or how much he needed us. Romans 5.8 says that, but God showed his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We didn't have to do anything to impress God. That's a hard concept to grasp if you're someone like me It feels like, you must be doing something all the time because there is so much that needs to be done. One time years ago, I was on a business trip to Japan, and I was looking at a plaque written in Japanese characters on the office wall, and I asked our translator what, what those words said. She said, it, it said, if we don't get it done now, when will we? If I don't do it, who will? Anybody else feel like that? Let me say that again. If we don't get it done now, when will we? If I don't do it, who will? I took a picture of that plaque and made it into a frame thing and hung it on my office wall at work. I have another quote from a very gifted engineer that I had the opportunity to work with in my early career. He wrote it at the bottom of a drawing this is back when we had drawings before CAD systems, um, on a new machine he was working on. He said, the very best we know how to do is usually just barely good enough. Both of these quotes fit me. Fortunately, I also have another quote that I rely on every time I get in over my head. I don't know who first said it, but it goes something like this. The task ahead of you is never greater than the power behind you. Praise God that we can count on him. Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ, who's, through Christ who strengthens me. Some of us have to-do lists, but when it comes to our spiritual lives, what we need is an already done list. The writer of Hebrews says, after making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And in Hebrews 4.3, he says, for we who have believed enter that rest. Faith is not work. Faith is a rest. Faith is not a verb. It's a noun. Faith is believing that God is who he says he is, that God has done what he said he has done, and that he will do what he has promised to do. Paul writing in Romans chapter 4, verse 20 and 21, he's talking about Abraham, and he says that no unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God. But he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. As a side note, uh, Chris's class on Wednesday night about David is really pretty cool. Um, if you have the opportunity to be there, I would certainly encourage you to come. Um, 
He's talking about how God's, in God's sovereignty, he shaped David's life and how that translates to us. In God's sovereignty, he is shaping our lives also. Faith is being fully persuaded. And when you are fully persuaded, you can rest. The, the issue is settled. Your mind is made up and your heart is at ease. We have all wrestled with making a tough decision. It can cause a lot of anxiety. I find that when you finally make the decision, the load is off and you can rest. Okay, so how does that apply to us today? God has already done everything we need. In Genesis, we learn that God, we learn that God created everything, including man, in six days and rested on the seventh. Notice that all the work was done before God rested. My natural inclination, and maybe yours too, would desire to be created on the first day so that I could, quote, help God finish with the rest of creation. The thought of having arriving after the work is done is hard for me. I just feel like a real slacker. But the point is that the work is done, and you and I are the beneficiaries of the work. God does not need our help. Man's first day was a day of rest, sitting with Christ. The letter to the Ephesians starts, to, starts by explaining what we have in Christ. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 1, 2, and 3 says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Verse 3 says that we are blessed with every spiritual blessing. So what are these spiritual blessings that Paul is talking about? Well, he starts in verse, uh, starting in verse 4, he says, For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us for adoptions as sons through Jesus Christ in accordance to the purpose of his will. Verse 6, he has freely given us his glorious grace. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace he lavished on us in all wisdom and understanding. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with a promised Holy Spirit. How's that for spiritual blessings? They're called spiritual because there's not a one of them that we could do on our own. The writer of Hebrews says in chapter 4, verses 9 and 10, There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from his own work, just as God did from his. The Apostle John put it this way in John chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. It says we're born of God. Second Corinthians 6, 18 says, I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says Lord, the Lord Almighty. If God is our father, we are his sons and daughters. Our worth is immeasurable. If you are a Christian here today, you are not a stranger to God. Even though you may sometimes feel all alone, you are not an orphan. Your Heavenly Father loves you and sees you as one of his children. And if you're here today and you do not know and have not trusted Christ in your life, you don't need to leave the same way you came in. Apostle John said in 1 John 3, 1, See what the kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. And because we are children, we are royalty. And because we are royalty, we can be seated with God. We can up unload all our burdens on him. 
It all starts with sitting and trusting in God's finished work. It is only when we have learned how to sit, we can begin to walk. Problem is, I never learned how to sit. I don't, I don't really believe this, but back in the day when people kept baby books, my mom has a baby book about me. And she wrote in that baby book that I was so, quote, roly-poly that I learned how to walk before I could actually sit up on my own. Once we understand our position that we are seated with Christ, we must begin to walk. Walking is us living everyday life here on earth. To walk is a figure of speech that Paul uses that means to order one's behavior. Years ago, Pastor Jason gave me a book that had a sentence I really liked. It said, while Jesus is representing me in heaven, may I reflect him on earth. While he pleads my cause, may I show forth his praise. As we're talking about walking, I want to read that again because I really want you guys to, to get that into your head that we are representing Christ here on earth. The author said, While Jesus is representing me in heaven, may I reflect him on earth. While he pleads my cause, may I show forth his praise. Have you ever asked yourself, does my earthly, earthly walk match my heavenly position? I know I have. I became a Christian in my early 20s, and for many years I had a license plate bracket that in bold letters said, Jesus is Lord. I finally took it off the car, because, not because I didn't believe it, but because my conduct while driving, whether intentional or unintentional, did not always reflect Jesus as being the Lord of my life. And I didn't want somebody thinking that guy driving that car is a Christian. And I don't want to be like him. So again, we're going to look to Ephesians to see what he says about walking. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, it says, I, therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. Those of you who remember Pastor John will also remember that he would always say, when you see the word therefore, you need to find out what the word is there for. The therefore in verse 1 is referring back to the blessings we have in Christ that Paul wrote about in the first three chapters. Because we've received all these spiritual blessings, this is how you need to walk. Occasionally, Pastor Jason would say something like about indicative and imperative, which I never knew what those words meant until he started bringing them up. I think of indicative as the facts. We are seated with Christ. We are blessed with all spiritual blessings. We have been raised with Christ. Jesus is Lord. We could go on and on talking about the facts about Christ. The imperative is the command. Based on the facts, this is what we are commanded to do. Paul gives an excellent example of indicative and imperative here because he makes a definite transition from our spiritual position in chapters 1, 2, and 3 to our practical living in chapters 4, 5, and 6. The way we conduct ourselves as Christians that have been blessed with all spiritual blessings is the subject of the next few chapters. Paul talks about every, everyday things like marriage, parenting, employers, employees, the church. We are now being admonished, encouraged, even motivated in how to walk. In verse 1 of chapter 4, he uses the words, I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Going on in chapter 4, he says, Now this I say, that you no longer walk as Gentiles do in the futility of their minds, to put off the old man which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt, and be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and put on the new man, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Our first Bible study leader, when Carol and I were first married, used to say, we are all sinners, and we carry around a shovel in our back pockets to dig up the old man, our old sinful natures. 
We are told to put off the old man and put on the new man. Ephesians 5, 2 says, And walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. In verses 8 and 10, he says, Walk as children of light and try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Many of us are likely familiar with the saved by grace verses in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. We read earlier, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It's of God, it is a gift of God, not of works, so no one may boast. That's the indicative. We are saved by grace. The imperative is verse 10. Because we are saved in grace, this is how we are to live. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. One of the classes we do in middle school has to do with our walk. We do it because kids need to understand that if people are put off by our talk, our behavior, or they can't trust us in the everyday things, why would they trust us when we talk to them about Christ? We have to ask ourselves questions. We have to ask ourselves, does our walk reflect the character of a child of God? I read a story many years ago, and I don't know if it's actually even true, but it makes a good point. Maybe you have read it also. An elderly gentleman was sitting on a bench outside the White House, all dejected. A little boy comes up to him and asks him what's wrong. The man says he's been trying to see the president for three days, but the guard will not let him in the gate. The little boy takes his hand, and they walk past the guards, through the gate, into the building, down the hall, and into the president's office. You see, the little boy was Tad Lincoln, Abraham's son. We need to remember who we are. We are sons and daughters of the king. We should walk according to our position. We have direct access to our Heavenly Father. I want to turn that little prayer I read earlier into a question. Actually, two questions. As Christ is representing me in heaven, am I reflecting him on earth? While he pleads my cause, am I showing forth his praise? We've talked about our seated position in Christ. We've talked about walking worthy of our position that we have been called to. Now we'll spend a few minutes talking about the stand we must take against the enemies of Christ. Paul probably had a reason for talking about sitting, walking, and standing in that order. If we do not understand our exalted position in Christ, or our walk, our walk will be hindered. If we have only a head knowledge of our position in Christ, our walk will be unfruitful also. If we do not have a clear understanding about our position in Christ, or we are not walking worthy of our position, we probably don't have to worry about our standing for Christ because we are not much of a threat to Satan and his followers. He can just ignore us because we will, be not, we will not be influencing anyone in a positive way for Christ. I think that's a pretty scary position for us Christians to be in. We've all been around people, uh, maybe ourselves, where their walk will not draw others to Christ. Friends may not even know that they consider themselves Christians. Spurgeon said, Many have the doctrines of grace, but few have the grace of the doctrines. A memory verse for many people is Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. That's a beautiful verse about God calling us, but it's written at the end of a paragraph with a very severe warning. In, Ch in Revelation chapter 3, John records three of the seven letters to the churches, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. In the paragraph in chapter 3, that is a letter to the church of Laodicea. The first, the four verses before the stand at your door, at the door and knock verse also contains the warning that says, I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. 
So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. He goes on to give even more condemning detail before he gets to verse 20. Do you ever feel only lukewarm? I know I do at times. But we don't have to. Turn back to Ephesians chapter 6 with me. Paul tells us in Ephesians 6, in verses 10 through 18, all about standing. And this is a passage of scripture that's going to be very familiar to all of you. Finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. And as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. Verse 16, in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can, ex you can ex extinguish the fiery darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. Paul tells us in verse 12 that our problem is not with flesh and blood, but with the rulers, authorities, cosmic powers, and evil forces in heavenly places. Now, I'm not one to see Satan and demons behind every bush. When something happens to me that I don't like, it's probably because of a poor decision that I have made that is not keeping with God's revealed truth not because Satan is out to get me. The word Satan means adversary. We cannot deny that there are evil forces in this world that will always attempt to interfere with God's plans for us. And we, we must take seriously the physical attacks on our minds, our bodies, and our spiritual life of God's people. Satan and demons are real. They are spoken of throughout the Bible and in most books of the New Testament. Jesus and the apostles all referred to them and dealt with them. James 4, 7 says, Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. The word he uses to fight these evil forces is stand. He says to put on the whole armor of God that we may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. The verb stand, the Greek verb stand literally means hold your ground. It's a very precious truth in this command. We are foolish if we think we can stand up against Satan on our own. 1 Corinthians 10, 12 says, Therefore let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. Now I'm a confident, um, class mostly filled type of guy, and this is a very scary verse to me. We are, not, we are not commanded to invade or attack an enemy. The word stand implies that we are defending ground that already belongs to God and therefore to us, his children. The weapons listed in Ephesians 6 are defensive, not offensive weapons. The armor, the helmet, breastplate, shield, shoes, even the sword can be used for defense. They all have specific pur purposes, but we're not going to study those purposes today because we are not talking about this because of trying to win a fight. It's Jesus, the point is that Jesus has already won the fight. You know, he won that victory over 2,000 years ago. Have you ever felt defeated in your own life? I think we all have. Have you ever prayed like I have prayed that someday when this or that happens, then God will be able to use me more effectively? Last week, our missionary Dustin Hoff, Dustin, <laughs> Dustin Olson, <laughs> told us um, that God put a call on each of our lives, and he encouraged us and challenged us to seek out that call and to obey that call that God put on our lives. 
When we have battles in our lives, we do not need to be praying for, for God to give us the victory. We need to be praising him because he already won the victory for us. Sure, the difficulties may, around us may not go away. They may not even change. Remember Paul praying multiple times because of his thorn in the flesh. God did not talk, take it away. But Paul said in Romans 8, 37, In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Our prayer may need to be that God will open our eyes so we can see ourselves as seated with Christ. Paul tells us in Ephesians 1, 21, that Christ is far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. Remember that Jesus has entrusted this spiritual battle to us. He purchased the ground we are defending with his blood. It's a privilege to be standing with him. We are given the shield of faith to turn away the fiery darts. Faith is understanding that Christ is on the throne. Faith is understanding that we are saved by grace. Faith is understanding that we have access to the Father through Christ. Faith is, faith is understanding that the Holy Spirit lives in us. As we conclude, um, I want you to remember the three things, that uh, we need to sit and know our position in Christ. We need to walk, i.e. live, in a manner worthy of our position in Christ. And we need to stand with a full armor of God so we can overcome when the enemy attacks our position. May we all pray daily that prayer that we talked about when we first started. While Jesus is representing me in heaven, may I reflect him on earth. While he pleads my cause, may I show forth his praise. We all have favorite verses. One of mine is Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. As we close, I want you to close your Bibles and close your eyes and imagine yourself not here in Bible Chapel, but in a first century home church approximately 30 years after the cross when Paul wrote this letter. Because of persecution, your church may be actually meeting in secret. All this Christian stuff is new to you. No one has Bibles. However, the elder of the home church has a handwritten copy of the letter that Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus. He ends the first portion of the letter with what we now call Ephesians chapter 3. Think of the encouragement these words would have meant to you sitting in that home church. Starting in verse 4 of chapter 3. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now, to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church, in Christ Jesus, throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. You've all heard it before that God's capacity and desire for giving far outweighs our ability to ask. Um, I will close in prayer, and then we'll have our final song. Lord Jesus, I thank you for today. I thank you that we can sit at your feet. Lord, I pray that we can walk the walk that you have intended for us. Lord, you've put a call on each one of our lives, and each call is different. Lord, as Dustin encouraged us, Lord, help us to follow that call. Do what you have given us the, the abilities to do that you have entrusted us with. Lord Jesus, I thank you for this day. I ask that you go with us, that you watch over and protect us, and that as we go about this week, we will sit at your feet and we'll, we will walk according 
to your call on our lives. I thank you, Jesus, in your holy and precious name. Amen.